Hi everyone uh, and welcome to uh, this uh, session uh, at the Business Pavilion. Uh, sorry, Swed Business Sweden Pavilion. Um, so I have the great pleasure today uh, to moderate this uh, session on uh, behalf of the Leadership Group for Industry Transition that is hosted at the Stockholm Environment Institute. And we have a lot of exciting uh, things to discuss. Um, let me start by inviting our first three speakers uh, to the stage. Uh, I'd like to invite now uh, Minister uh, Per Bolund. Uh, will be also joined uh, by uh, Bo Krovig uh, from uh, LKAB, but he will be joining us virtually. Um, and then we will also be joined uh, to this panel um, by Annika from um, Vattenfall. But let us start with uh, Minister. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Perfect. Um, I would like to ask you um, um, an opening question. We had today the lead summit, the leadership group for industry transition brought together around 14 ministers today and more than 10 CEOs. Um, this is great and I'd like to see um, uh, here some of your t key takeaways from the summit. Um, how will the leadership group drive the industry transition globally? But of course, I'm also curious about your vision for Sweden and how Sweden uh, aims to accelerate industry transition mm -hmm. and where are we in the world? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here uh, speaking to you today. And uh, it feels so good to be among frontrunners. Uh, it's the right environment to be in on a climate uh, summit like this. So uh, I think that uh, this is an opportunity to really show what can be done and how fast it can be done as well. Um, we, of course, know from science uh, that we have to do a lot. Uh, we are already in a very grave situation. We have a climate crisis that is upon us. Uh, we can see the examples of that uh, every day in uh, our environments locally, but also on a global level with uh, floodings, with droughts, with forest fires, with uh, severe weather events. And uh, we know that uh, unless we tackle climate change and we do it in a very rapid pace, things will only get worse. And that will have a devastating effect on our communities, on our economies, on our business opportunities and on our labor markets. So um, the answer for us is quite clear. We have to uh, do as much as we can and we also know that the only way to do that is to work together. Uh, and uh, I think that is perhaps the uh, most important uh, message I got from the Lead It Summit that I uh, visited and chaired uh, earlier today, that uh, we can do a lot from uh, the government perspective. We can have ambitious climate policies. Uh, we can make sure that uh, we have a price on carbon, that uh, we have the opportunities and the investments uh, from public side to uh, achieve a sustainable society. But we also are very much aware that uh, it's impossible to uh, do it from a government position alone. It's only in cooperation and working together with other forces in society, with enterprise, with civil society, and with many other parts of our societies. It's only then that we can actually succeed and come all the way. And not least for the reason that we have so much to do in such a short time. There is no time for uh, uh, having um, contradictions, uh, for uh, fighting among ourselves uh, when it comes to doing the work. We have to make sure that we give each other the opportunities we need to actually all the time do more than we have previously done. And uh, when I see... Uh, and hear the voices around the table at the lead it uh, uh, meetings I hear voices saying that this is not a question of sharing burdens this is not a question of uh, who has to do what in order to lower emissions this is a question of uh, making opportunities and making things happen and uh, also finding ways to actually uh, use this opportunity to renew our economies to uh, renew our business models to uh, make the investments that not only lowers emission and takes us to a zero emission society and zero emission enterprises, but also provides us with new technologies that produces things more efficiently, uh, that uh, gives us better uh, labor environments, that open up our uh, labor market for young people who want to be part of the solution, uh, working every day for a more sustainable future and a more sustainable planet. So 
in order for our businesses and enterprises to get the competence they need, they have to show that they are a part of the solution to the uh, environmental problems that we are facing. And it's also clear from the lead summits that if governments can do it alone, it's also clear that businesses can't do it alone. We have to create opportunities for each other. So for example, if uh, Vattenfall is to deliver all the uh, green electricity they, they want, of course they have to have the grids, they have to have the infrastructure, and that is uh, a government uh, position to, to solve their problems. And we have to also create, of course, the uh, business opportunities for uh, the enterprises. And uh, we see that if we can combine, uh, make sure that uh, businesses and uh, others who uh, have a severe climate impact actually have to pay for their emissions and at the same time uh, lowering the risks and uh, funding together uh, investments in a more sustainable um, business uh, pr production cycle that is also an opportunity that gives uh, our finance sector and gives our enterprise sector the opportunity to do these investments that we see so much need to do and we have to do it in a very rapid pace. So. It's obvious to me that the, re the only solution to this quite grave crisis that we are in, the only solution is to find ways to work together. And uh, I think that LEADIT is a very good example of how business representatives work together with government representatives, how uh, rich countries work together with developing countries, how businesses from different parts of the world find ways to work together, uh, creating global value chain around uh, zero carbon products and uh, and uh, production uh, cycles. So I think that the LEADIT uh, seminars and the LEADIT uh, cooperation has really shown not only to us but to the world that if we work together and if we have the same agenda and really strive uh, towards maximizing our efforts uh, we can really uh, achieve more than we could do one by one. So that gives me hope and that is also in my view um, a way to make sure that we can also move the global agenda and provide us with the opportunities we need to uh, achieve uh, a stable climate uh, also internationally, for example here at this COP meeting. So uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here and uh, continue to contribute uh, working together uh, to achieve more because we know that is what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, Minister Bolland. And thanks for also uh, the organizers um, uh, for giving the opportunity today to continue to demonstrate that industry transition is possible. And as we do in Needed Group, uh, and encourage others uh, to, to do the same. Um, let me now turn to you, Annika. Uh, you were with us this morning. Um, and uh, as Minister Boland uh, stated, we need a lot of energy um, and we all know that uh, industry is not the only sector that will um, compete for this energy. We need renewable energy, of course hydrogen, they all need to scale up, we need infrastructure for it too. And Vattenfall, you are not just uh, the, you know, in one of the biggest energy companies uh, in Sweden, but also all across Europe. So how are you preparing for this challenge? Do you think we have everything we need in terms of policy and permitting? The challenge is big. What are your plans? Well, the plan, first of all, is, and, and I want to sort of pick up what you said, I think speed and collaboration is going to be absolutely key to everything. And in Vattenfall, we have set a very clear target to enable fossil-free living within a generation. And for us, to show that it's important to speed up and do things here and now. We have both sort of uh, doubled our ambitions when it comes to our climate target. So we now have committed to reduce more than 77% of our own emissions until 2030. And on top of that, we also say that we need to latest 2040 be net zero. And that goes for the entire value chain. And of course, in order for us to be able to do that, we need to work very closely with customers, with suppliers, and both give them incentives to ensure that you move in that direction, but also uh, sort of be part of forming the partnerships that can develop the new products and processes, and etc. So uh, I think all of us, and, and you said everyone need to collaborate, we need all the different actors to be part of it. And I think that's when we all need to remember that every one of us can do a big difference, regardless of if we are a customer or a supplier or the actual production partner. 
and every little step uh, sort of counts. And so when we look at it, we say that we need to look at every part of the full value chain and we need to find where can we have the biggest impact, either by pushing a technology or demanding something or even form partnerships to develop the new technologies. So it's very much about working together, see where you can have the leverage and ensure that you push that. And, and on your question, do we have everything in place? No. I mean, the, a lot of the technology is there, but then we need to be able to scale it up. So we have proven that the technology works. But how about ensuring that we have the permitting process? That's something that I keep pushing. The permitting process is very important and we need to work also and get the consent. However, we need to be aware that all these vast majorities of new electricity from wind and solar, etc. It takes time to get it in place. The permitting processes are long, so we should not underestimate the, the need of ensuring that the processes run on time, because otherwise we won't be able to reach our climate targets. So I think this is something where we definitely need to work together and ensuring that. But then technology-wise, for me as an engineer, I would say the technology is there. So now it's a matter of really scaling it up and speed, speed, speed. Uh, and also to build on what you said, I think it's really important. I'm, I'm worried about companies that haven't yet sort of stepped up. Because uh, if we don't act here and now, uh, it might be difficult and we not, might need to invest extra in these things. But if we don't do it, that will be devastating. Then we will be out and, and, and not really there. So it's a matter of doing it to grasp the new business opportunities. And we can find so many exciting things when we work together like this. Thanks a lot, uh, Annika. Um, and since we have spoken about value chains, uh, I'd like to turn to one of the sort of important value chain partners of the hybrid initiative and turn to Bo. Um, and Bo, we, we work a lot also as part of the leadership group. Um, and I've heard you say a few times that it's, it all starts in the mind. Um, but you are now starting a new journey. You have a new uh, vision for your company. Could you share that vision with us? Yeah, so yes, of course. Um, but I think it's important what both uh, Minister Bolund and Annika from Vattenfall was through collaboration and to invent things together in cooperation is so essential. I think that companies and industries has worked very separate from each other and I think it's important with a, a new form of entrepreneurial uh, approach when we are going to uh, solve these great challenges. Well, we decided that um, a couple of years ago that we couldn't continue uh, the way we do it because we produce iron ore that have 20%, 25% oxygen in it. And our clients are adding coke and coal to get out the oxygen from the iron ore to make steel. So it was a perfect match when we came together with Vattenfall and, and uh, SSAB. They wanted... Vattenfall wanted to have large-scale hydrogen production. Uh, SSAB wanted to produce uh, fossil-free steel. And we wanted to uh, create a system, a production system, where we could be CO2-free in our processes latest 2040, 2045. So we started in a laboratory. We continued with the pilot plant that is there now. And uh, 2026, we will together start the first uh, demonstration plant in Malmberg, in the Arctic parts of Sweden. <clears throat> and in 2030, we will be up in industrial scale. And after that, we will, at our mines, build um, sponge iron production, where we reduce the oxygen from the iron ore already at the mine and then transport it to our, our clients. Together, we will save not only the 700,000 tons of CO2 that we uh, emit today, but together 35 million tons of CO2 on a yearly basis. 
with ourselves, but mostly with our clients. That is to take the first step, but that's not enough. It all starts in the mind. So in parallel with this, we're also developing together with other partners, new ways of mining on greater depth that are CO2 free, that are uh, autonomous and electrified. But we can't st stop there. Of course, we know that mining, mining is affecting uh, land. And today we are putting on tailings and dams things that we could make value of. So the third, um, the third focus for us is to make value out of the things that we today regard as waste. We will produce phosphorus and, um, and um, uh, rare earth elements for the European market. Materials that are all essential um, and critical uh, for uh, Europe in now and in the future. So we have started this journey. It started in the lab, it started in the mine, and now we have the pilot plant there. And our partner SSAB have, have delivered the first uh, fossil free steel. Uh, to Volvo that has produced the first vehicle out of it. So we are on our way, but we're not there yet. It's only the start of the long journey. Thanks a lot, Bob. Um, and we're only in the first half of the discussion, but I'm already very impressed from what I'm hearing. I hope you feel the same. Um, and today is actually the Innovation and Science Day at COP26. So I can't help but ask you, Mr. Uh, Minister Bolland, what makes Sweden um, so entrepreneurial? Well, I would say that uh, Sweden for, for quite a long time has, has been quite innovative. Uh, what has changed is perhaps how we use our innovation capacity. Uh, previously we've done it to produce excellent grade steel, that is uh, really uh, a product that is wanted all over the world. We have uh, produced uh, low carbon electricity, but now we are really uh, focusing our innovation efforts to uh, also make a strong climate impact, to make sure that uh, we actually uh, move ahead of the rest of the world. Um, not because we want to brag about it and because uh, we uh, only think that that will uh, benefit ourselves. We believe it will, but uh, it's not least to also show the world what is possible. And um, I see a danger if you uh, only base your, your climate policies on doing the easy things, uh, planting trees and uh, uh, perhaps lowering emissions where the, it doesn't hurt very much and uh, where the cost is cheap because then you risk facing being stuck in a situation where you only have the difficult emissions left to solve in 10 years' time or so. So working in this way with the most difficult part of lowering emissions, with the heavy industry, uh, I think that is, is really a signal that the world needs to see. Uh, it is possible to make a change even in the parts of society where it perhaps has been perceived as being most difficult. But uh, through innovation, through uh, new ways of working together, we have shown that it is not only possible, but it is also a way to actually uh, reinvigorate your economy, uh, to get massive investments into, well, parts of Sweden that for decades has been uh, parts where people were moving out. Now we have the opposite, people are moving into the north of Sweden because that's where the jobs are developing, the green jobs in our new innovative industries. So I think that uh, showing that, uh, that these uh, lines of cooperation and these new industrial investments really are not uh, only a way to, to share our, our burden and to uh, do what we need to do in order to lower emissions, but we also see it as uh, really the way to make our economies function better and uh, our labor market to deliver more jobs than we would have if we hadn't pursued this path. I think that is really also something that inspires me very much and I hope that is also something that inspires others. So uh, innovative power is, is good, but if you use it to, uh, to uh, save the world, so to speak, then it's even better. And I'm very proud that this is what we are focusing on in this project. Brilliant, and it's really empowering to see that we're, we're today not only seeing that industry transition is technically possible, that the business case is there, but it's also that a just transition is, is possible and within reach. Um, thank you for that. And Annika, 
Yes, I, I also wanted to comment on, on the innovation part and, and really stress the importance of having the clear ambitious targets because it is by setting clear ambitious both political targets as well as co company targets and you need to have them very ambitious in order for you not to be able exactly like you said just do incremental changes you need the tough target to release people's innovation spirit and to encourage that you need to work together to find the new solutions and and just by doing having the clear targets and start back casting that's when you can re release an awful lot of innovation spirit and that's definitely what we see and i think that's also where sweden the, the good thing you get the positive spiral. You see a number of good examples of this in Sweden, which is spurring and inspiring others to do that as well. And I think this is also, if I want to encourage each and every one here, please use all these good examples that you have that are showing that we can make a difference and we need to do that. Uh, so use that inspiration uh, because that's the way that we will be able to push forward. And then also when we collaborate uh, that's when we start using resources much more circular because something that is a waste for someone can be a very important sort of key uh, virgin input into someone else's processes. So we need to work much more on integrating the different systems. That's when we will see the big uh, sort of gains really to use resources more wisely. Absolutely agree on that and it's great that we also talked about uh, circularity uh, within this context. Bo, well, maybe um, a last question for you, um, and this is a personal interest because we've discussed this uh, in some conversations earlier, but I heard that um, a lot of young engineers, they also, uh, many people want to now work for SSRB and you have a great interest from young people. Um, so I wanted to ask about that and how do you see the change in the region, in the north, uh, where you are based? Yeah, um, we will have uh, a challenge in, in getting uh, a competence, of course, for the future. We are, you know, mining and heavy industry is not normally located close to universities or in heavily urban areas. We are normally in rural areas and we're working a lot, but I think that if we put together and tell the young people, the young engineers, uh, what we are doing, the way we're working, non-hierarchical, cooperative, working together, and where we could use this, what I say, one of the assets of Sweden is small is beautiful. If you're coming into this system, you can be a part of really making change for the future. And and up in the north of Sweden, we're going to invest like uh, 40 billion euros during the next 15 to 20 years. So there will be a lot of opportunities to be a part of solving one of the greatest challenges, global challenges for uh, the world. So I think already we can see that there is a big interest. We could see a big interest, not only from Swedish young um, academy engineers and so on, but also international. Very inspiring. And um, now we will um, move on to our next uh, speakers and continue to hopefully inspire others and those watching um, and also hear more from uh, other frontrunners we have in the room. So I'd like to invite uh, Martin Pei from SSAB. Uh, we have Lena uh, from Skanska with us as well. Uh, I'd like to also invite uh, Lars from uh, Volvo Group to join us. Thank you. Um, let me um, start uh, with you, Martin, because um, we've heard uh, just in the previous discussion about how Sweden inspires others. Now, um, SSAB definitely have inspired others uh, to go green in the steel sector. Um, in the last year, even only, we have seen a great increase in announcements from different companies from around the world. But that means competition. So you have started the journey, but how, how do you see the competition going forward? Will you still be um, sort of number one or in the race to zero? 
Thank you for uh, this question. Uh, when we started uh, the initiative together with uh, LKB and Vattenfall back in 2016, uh, there were a lot of uh, skepticism in the industry. Uh, many of our colleagues uh, were uh, thinking that uh, these are uh, some crazy people from Sweden and uh, uh, we, we, we watch how they how will uh, succeed. And now we have worked very hard. We have got uh, a lot of uh, support from uh, the Swedish energy for their research work. We have carried out significant uh, uh, research activities, uh, build up a competence in our institutes, in our universities, and in our own uh, uh, joint owned company, the Hybrid Development AB, but also in Vattenfall, LKB, and SCCB. Now we have shown that this technology works. And uh, we have uh, uh, together with uh, Volvo, supplied uh, our first Fosafri steel that has shown a great vehicle. So now we notice that uh, there is uh, suddenly a huge lot of interest from uh, our uh, colleagues in, the, in our industry, not only in Europe, but also in Asia, a lot of interest, uh, and in other parts of the world. So what we have done so far has uh, triggered this uh, interest, which uh, we believe is... Uh, a good thing for climate. Uh, st the steel industry has been working very much in a competitive environment since a long time back. Uh, and we, we think competition is good uh, because uh, only with our decarbonization in Sweden and Finland, which we can do in our production, that will not help very much for the climate. But if we trigger the whole industry's transformation, that makes really the difference. So th this, I think, uh, we should be very proud that we have started this journey together in Sweden. Thank you. Um, I will follow up, but since we are already talking about uh, cooperation, um, so Lars, I know you have this motto that partnership is the new leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, the first value chain cooperation in the steel sector came from uh, hybrid and Volvo cooperation. Um, but then there are a lot of uncertainties. So how do you see partnership addressing uncertainties that are lying ahead of us? Well, for me, it's very clear that we are moving in a completely new landscape now. Uh, there are so much more uncertainties, so many unknowns in the equation going forward. So let's, in the past, it was rather easy to work with research and development. It was a little bit looking backwards and then try to extrapolate a little bit into the future, some kind of linear development. That doesn't fly anymore. Now it's disruptive. We are adding new technologies um, to the menu. We're adding new components to the menu. And that means that if you don't open up for partnerships with true partners on board, then you're doomed to fail because it is not linear anymore, it's disruptive. You have to dare to try, you have to dare to fail, and you have to onboard these partners. And then you have to find a partner, like SSAB in this case, where you share the values, you share the direction, but you also share a belief in that we don't really know where we're going to end up. We don't really know. Most likely we are going to change direction a little, a little bit down the road, but that's also part of the fun and get rid of these transactional relationships and just go for it. And uh, to be honest, if we don't do that, then we will fail. It's a matter of survival. And, um, great, to, great to have that enthusiasm uh, once again. Um, and Lena, once again, I'll go back to the topic of innovation because today is really all about that at COP26. Um, and you are one very innovative uh, company at Skanska. Um, and in particular, you have come up with uh, very um, forward-looking technologies to bring in transparency, to bring in traceability to the sector, because accountability is very important. It's, it's great to be ambitious, but we need to put words into action. We are doing that here today. Uh, um, we are hearing that it is being done in Sweden. But how about uh, from Skanska? What is your experience? Well, we think it's really important how we are able to drive change. So uh, we have a climate target to become net zero by 2045, including our value chain. And uh, in order to know where we are at, of course, we need to be able to measure. And we have quite a large value chain and quite a lot. Just for an example, almost 40% of the materials in the world is actually 
connected to the built environment and the construction industry being a part of that, of course. So to us, having quite a vast value chain in the industry, it's important how you can track in an efficient way. And we have done that to quite a high degree in the European market, but looking into the US market and the need to drive transition there, we did see that we could use the knowledge and expertise from the European market and foremost actually from the Nordics and transfer it to the US. So we actually have built or uh, developed a digital tool, we call it the Embodied Carbon in Construction Calculator, EC3 for short. And we have now uh, about 15,000 uh, materials uh, collected their carbon emissions in this digital tool. It's open source, free for everyone to use. I think that's part of the success. And by using this tool, we can ensure that already in the design phase, in planning, in sourcing, you can actually track and compare the carbon emissions just like you do with cost. And by that, we're working together with some of the big tech companies like Autodesk and Microsoft. And Microsoft are actually concluding that they have seized the potential to reduce embodied carbon emissions, that's from materials foremost, by 30 to 60% by using this digital tool. So we have to look into innovation and, in, and technical solutions in different kinds of ways. And I, I'm just concluding that in the US, we have all these great tech companies really sharing up and sharing and also contributing to the continuous development of this tool today. So in our industry and in heavy industry, of course, we also look into innovations when it comes to mixtures of concrete, when it comes to we have developed a near zero asphalt. But we also need to remember to question in the design, already in the design phase, maybe we can reduce by the design 10 or 15 percent of the materials needed and then we can use the carbon-free materials of course. Well thanks Lina and uh, as a database geek I've actually gone into the transparent um, uh, database and it, it is really quite impressive what you have there already. Um, because we talked about transparency and uh, and you know the importance of transparency is, is about accountability but it's also about creating a level playing field. Now you are front runners, but we have, of course, you are also globally traded. Uh, you produce products that are globally traded. How can we, maybe we start with Martin and, and then ask you the same question, Lars. How do we create an, a level playing field? It is important that we, uh, we have a mechanism that uh, the front runners or companies uh, who dare to uh, make the transition before everything is in place uh, can be encouraged. Uh, so, uh, level playing field is uh, extremely important as uh, we see it. We are prepared to do this uh, transition, take a higher risk, but it is important that uh, the policymakers really uh, take this question seriously so that we can create uh, a more, uh, say, driving force that uh, more companies can start the journey. As I said earlier, it's uh, only a few front runners or the first movers coalition, which is very good, of course but it's not enough. We need to really create a situation where a uh, majority of the industry dares to take this uh, uh, step to go away from the fossil-based production technology. And we have shown it works, and now really we need to do it so a level playing field can create the momentum. And Lars? No, for, for us as a global company, I mean, uh, we are a Swedish company headquartered in Sweden, but. Um, 2% of the turnover in Sweden, so truly global company, you will meet us across the globe. Uh, but we see, luckily, uh, that the interest is definitely global. So everything we are doing here in our, let's say, local value chain will be exported, will go global. And um, as Martin was into, the whole steel industry needs to move, definitely. And uh, I rather often get the question about the cost level, for example. And, Will this ever be um, competitive uh, compared to fossil-based steel? And it's a ridiculous question because in the long run there will not be a fossil-based steel. It will be tough competition, Martin. But then it will be tough competition around fossil-free steel, of course. So what we are doing now is really leading, paving the way, but it will go global. It will go on export. 
Brilliant. Um, and I have one more question. Um, may, perhaps you can each also take turns. So I'm a big fan of uh, Sweden's uh, roadmaps, the fossil-free Sweden uh, roadmaps that uh, many of your sectors, I think 22 sectors, have engaged in. Um, do we think that this is the secret of uh, Swedish success in, uh, you know, in the recent years, in particular, in t- taking really global leadership on industrial transition? Because it is really about public-private partnership. What do you think? Admit, uh, Skanska, we, we had the honor to chair uh, the development of the roadmap for our industry for construction and engineering. And we went all in, I have to admit, because we thought it was a great opportunity, uh, both knowing that the politicians were on board, uh, but also to get everyone else on board. So we went actually inviting the whole value chain, including finance. And I have to admit, we learned a whole lot of the, those different perspectives. And that for us, as an international company, to learn from those perspectives, as well as to bring it forward internationally in how we work uh, in other markets, that has been really important. Important and I think it strengthens us and our perspectives there. Brilliant. I think that the roadmaps as such, that's a tool, but I think from a Swedish perspective it's very much about collaboration. And I think that this panel, if you think about it, is a brilliant example of a very complex value chain. I mean, we're starting with Bo and LKAB down in the mine, then someone has to produce the green hydrogen, Annika and Vattenfall. Someone needs to be the expert on producing the fossil-free steel. Someone will be the first taker producing the world's first fossil-free steel-based uh, vehicle and then providing it to Skanska in quarries to be used then in your operation and supported all the way from the Swedish government in the research in the hybrid, in the electric site that we uh, perform together with Skanska. So I think it's a true success, success story for the Swedish cal- collaboration. Do you agree, Martin? I, I agree. The collaboration uh, aspect is uh, absolute key. Uh, we can't do this uh, transformation alone because this is a systematic transformation. It's a transformation that has never never been done before. So we need to work together along the value chain, as Lars described it, a superb uh, example. But we next step, I think beyond the fantastic roadmaps, we really need to create uh, the engagement from the whole society. Now, Sweden, we talk about uh, today, the topic innovation, fantastic country, a lot of innovative ideas, great companies, but we can't risk loss out on implementation. And that is a risk as we see it now, because SSAB has decided to transform into this new production technology as soon as possible. And the limiting factor is actually not the technology or risk taking or customers uh, that we know that is already there. It's the time needed to get the power transmitting lines to our production sites so that we actually can phase out to the coal-based plus furnace-based process. That's the time-setting factor. So uh, we, we need to get the whole society to support this transformation. It's not only for SSAB, it's for uh, the whole country. It's for the world. I think that uh, we really need to do next step uh, together. I hope it will be a, a continuation of this uh, roadmap work so that we get everybody Energize. So this is a good thing to do. This is the right thing to do. And uh, of course, each person as an individual might need to give up something. But for the greater good, we should do it for our future generations. Absolutely. And Lena? I just have to add here, so in case you find us being a bit too smug now, being Swedish corporations uh, and, and being really keen on driving innovation in the, in the sustainable direction, I, we have to admit there is quite a challenge to scale and to we really need to emphasize uh, that the business case is key and Sweden is quite a small market unfortunately so we need to go far beyond that we need to collaborate at the international arena and just like we have done here today at the Lidit uh, I think that is so important for us to be able to scale these innovative solutions because we need the grander market and then we need the grander understanding when it comes to how you actually implement and scale 
these kinds of solutions. And I just have to say, and, and Gotcha, you are really uh, leading the lead. It. Uh, so I think that to us, being part of such a cooperation also at an international arena, also involving the US, uh, which is quite a big market for a lot of Swedish cooperation, is so important because there is yet um, there is yet some steps to be taken to have more of a common understanding internationally as well. I couldn't agree more and um, of course the uh, US is one and then Lead It initiative is led by India and Sweden um, and I, as, as the, the chair of today I could maybe still two minutes to say that we've built a roadmaps methodology uh, based on a uh, fossil free Sweden uh, approach. Um, so we have a tool now that you can actually access online at industrytransition.org and we'll be supporting India in the coming year in the steel and cement sector in a road mapping process. But really a great point to end this discussion, but invite the uh, Minister Bolun back because we ended with some questions that I'd like to uh, raise with him. But thank you so much, uh, all of you. Thank you. Minister Bolland, uh, welcome back. Um, I think it was really uh, interesting that where we stopped, we stopped at the need to scale up and the need for implementation. So I know that Fossil Free Sweden is, uh, is also working towards implementation of the roadmaps now, that is the next stage. Could you share with us what's on the horizon and how the government will support uh, these very inspiring companies that we have in this country? In Sweden. Well, absolutely, and uh, this is a very uh, inspiring uh, and, and a learning voyage for us as well. Uh, I think that previously governments perhaps have just said, uh, okay, we legislate, this is what you have to achieve, and then we just leave it to the market to solve how. Uh, this is actually a new way to work uh, where the government also steps in. Uh, we have made it a bit harder on ourselves because we have to be part of the solution. We have to make sure that uh, the business side has the solutions they need in order for them to deliver. So, uh, of course, this is, uh, puts a big mandate on our shoulders as well. But uh, I would say it's, it's a welcome mandate that we, uh, we take with, with uh, joy. Um, so I would say in order to not just have solutions at the lab scale, which we are well aware that there are so many solutions, uh, and the, the, what we need to do now is really to implement them at a larger scale, hopefully on a global scale, where they can replace the, the fossil-based solutions that we have had uh, too long, uh, I would say. So we found that we have uh, three main ways to actually make that happen. One is to provide the, uh, we, we call them the free, the free Fs. Uh, so it's the, the framework, making sure that we have the long time direction, uh, that industry and also the financial sector has to do the investments to, to borrow the money and to, to make sure that it's funded. They know that this is the direction that we have to take. It's zero carbon, that's the only direction that is, is vi viable. Um, so we have the, uh, the climate framework uh, that has been set in Swedish law, so, and, and we have quite a broad uh, majority in, in our parliament behind this, so it's, it's not really a strong political question around this. The other F is, is financing. Uh, we know that we have to provide the financial solutions as well. Um, we know uh, for a fact that the market, the financial markets, won't just do it uh, out of uh, generosity. Uh, they have to see the business case in it in order to really invest and make sure that there are uh, funding possibilities. So uh, through uh, taking part of the, uh, the risk, uh, risk management, uh, through being, uh, putting, putting our skin in the game, as we say in the financial sector, to actually provide part of the financing is also a way to make this happen at a much greater scale than would otherwise have been the case and also at a much uh, more rapid pace. So uh, framework and financing. And the third F I would like to add is, is also making friends and uh, making sure that uh, we are actually friends in this. And uh, Fossil Free Sweden, which is a cooperation where the government is, is funding the base work, but is really done together with industry, where 22 different business sectors have said that, yes, we have the road towards zero emissions for our whole sector in industry. But we also have some requests on the government. Uh, we need you to do this and this and this in order to actually achieve our part of the game. Well, then of course that provides us with the information we need in order to make the right solutions, the right decisions from government side to make this happen and to really also open up the opportunities for, for the business side. So if we have all these three Fs uh, in place, 
I'm now seeing that what previously was just a very good idea in a lab or something that was tested by some sort of a lab rat working in a small environment can now be actually moved into large industry processes and be made at national scale where we are actually now doing the investments but I believe also at the international scale, uh, replacing the fossil industries that we have today. And we know we have to replace them and we have to do it fast. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I couldn't uh, agree more. And uh, I mean, today we've learned uh, that the technologies are there, the partnerships are there, the challenges are there, but we are aware of the challenges and working uh, towards the solutions. Um, and things are happening really fast. Uh, so perhaps I'll see you at the next COP, uh, but I feel inspired and I hope those watching here and here with us uh, feel the same. So I'd like to thank all of you, to you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bolland, and all of our excellent speakers. Thank you. Thank you.